Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our next breakout session. And if you have not already done so, we are a, we're going to try to be a cozy group. So if you can kind of scoot in here uh, a little bit toward the center, and then afterward, be sure to go back to your original seats, because I know how that goes. So it is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce author Angela Joy. Um, I can assure you that Angela Joy comes to us with the most generous of spirit. Uh, and this morning's session will be focused on her book, Black is a Rainbow Color. So Angela is joining us via Zoom today. She tried with all her might to get to us. However, she is um, receiving yet another award for one of her, for her latest book, which will be focused on in the afternoon. She's going to D.C. early tomorrow, so there was no way we could get her here and then to D.C. in time. So, like I said, she tried with all of her might to do that, but she, um, she is, we're grateful to have her here via Zoom. So, brief introduction of Angela Joy. She was born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, before graduating summa cum laude from the University of Minnesota. She attended New York University and Spelman College. Angela traveled extensively as a background vocalist, also working in television and movie soundtracks. She uses lessons learned in music to write lyrical poetry for children, including Black as a Rainbow Color and Caldecott Honor Book, Choosing Brave, How Mamie Till Mo Mobley and Emmett Till Sparked the Civil Rights Movement. She lives in Southern California with her husband and two children, yet will always consider Minneapolis her home. Angela's next book, Ordinary Days, The Seeds, Sound, and City That Grew Prince, Prince Rogers Nelson, is due in, for release in fall 2023. So uh, the Emmett Till book, Choosing Brave, will be our afternoon session, so if you want to come back and join us then. And uh, thank you to Angela Joy for sending me that introduction. However, the um, Choosing Brave has also won two additional honors since that was written. So in addition to the Caldecott honor, uh, Choosing Brave has won Coretta, the Coretta, Coretta Scott King Award and the Robert F. Siebert Honor Book. So without any further delay, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Angela Joy, joining us by Zoom. Welcome, Angela. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Jen, for that lovely introduction. I appreciate that. I do wish I could be there with all of you to shake a hand and give a hug. Uh, that personal interaction is so important, but at the same time, I'm so thankful for Zoom. Um, I think a lot of us are used to communicating in this way, so we'll give it a shot. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free. I believe we have uh, both Jen and Miss Renee in the audience somewhere, or maybe someone else. I can't see you, um, it's, it's but just me. raise a I'm hand. Here. Hello, hello. <laughs> okay, so just raise a hand and... Um, Someone will come to you, and that way we can interact using the best of technology that we can to uh, make this go. So, uh, as was mentioned, I am an author, but uh, like all of you, I wear many hats. There are many parts to my identity. I'm a sister. I'm a Girl Scout. I'm a butterfly farmer. That's one of our 400 butterflies that we've raised from Caterpillar. I'm a pet owner. I'm a daughter. I'm a Japanese gardener, which takes much care. I care for my birds in my yard, and I care for my friends, and they care very well for me. But my most important job is that of mother. Now, when my children were small, this is a picture of them at that age. They're about six and four. And at that time, we were living in Tennessee, and I was preparing to share the first official Black History Month with them. Being the planner that I am, I uh, had a list of books that I wanted to read and I had downloaded lesson plans from the internet and I had music that I wanted to play and sing and dance with them. But before I could get a good start in my presentation to my six and four year old, my daughter stops me and she says, mommy, 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 wait, why do you keep calling us black? We're brown. You know, that, that kindergarten superiority, like, hey, lady, you don't even know your colors. We're brown. And it threw me. I was working under the assumption that 
she knew she was black, but because we weren't in a black community and because I hadn't taught it explicitly, she didn't realize that black is both a color and a culture. It took me a while um, with my friends to figure out how to explain this, uh, how to bridge the literal and the cultural and the figurative. And so the refrain that I came up with is black is a color, black is a culture. That seemed to help. And so with that phrase ringing in my brain, I thought, well, maybe other people could use this idea too. And that's when I wrote black is a rainbow color. I'm going to share it with you today. And as I say to all audiences, as we go through, please make a note of any illustrations that you like in particular, or any illustration that you have a question about. And we can come back. We will have, um, I'll show this screen again at the end. We will have the thumbnails that we can reference. Um, so you can say, hey, Miss Angela Joy, which can we talk about this one? And we will, we will go there. So without further ado. This is black is a rainbow color. Red is a rainbow color. Green sits next to blue. Yellow, orange, violet, indigo. They are rainbow colors too, but my color is black. And there's no black in rainbows. Black is a crayon tangled in a box. Black is a feather on white winter snow. Black is the dirt where sunflowers grow. My color is black. Black is the braid in my best friend's hair. Black are the bottoms of summertime feet. Black are soft circles that spin down the street. My color is black. Black is a rhythm, black is the blues. Black is sidewalking in spit-shined shoes. Black is the robe on Thurgood's back. Black are the trains on railroad tracks. Black are the eyes on salted peas. Black are the shadows of old magnolia trees. Black is molasses from tall sugar cane. Black is soft singing. Hush now, don't explain. Black is the skillet for bread to fry. Black are dreams and raisins left out in the sun to die. Black is the color of ink staining page. Black is the mask that shelters his rage. Black are the birds in cages that sing. Black is a color. Black is a culture. Black is history. Black is family. Black is memory. Black is community. Black is the love that lives inside of me. My color is black. Black are the stones bearing witness to prayer. Black is the faith in a freedom not seen. Black was the man who gave the world his dream. Black is a color. Black is a culture. Black is the power of movement and pain. Black is the heart of a candle and flame. Black are the branches that carry my name, weaving, wrapping, lifting, <laughs> laughing, hoping, grasping, quiet, strong. Our color is black. So you see, there is no black in rainbows, no black in green or blue, but in my box of crayons, black is a rainbow too. Now, as we talk about black being col color, black being a culture, the natural question is what is culture? Uh, the definition that I have come up with is a group of people who share the same ethnicity, language, rules and customs, heroes, music, arts, 
They share food, they share clothing, and maybe they share holidays. With this definition, we see that we are all part of many different cultures. We've got school culture. The Muskegon Heights Tigers are very special to my heart. We've got religious culture, sport culture, the Lions. I, it was hard for me to put that up there, I got to tell you, because I'm from Minnesota, so I'm a Vikings fan, but it's all right. Um, hobby culture, the Star Trek Trekkies, or fishing culture, career culture, ethnic culture. We're all part of many cultures. We all wear many hats. All of these cultures share a language. All of these cultures share rules and expectations. Some of them have a certain type of dress. Others do not. Uh, some have a, a designated food or a favorite food. Others do not. But Either way you look at it, we're all part of many different cultures. And I love pointing this out because sometimes it feels like when we talk about ethnic culture, um, it gets uncomfortable because mm, maybe we're not black. And so maybe this doesn't belong to us or uh, maybe we're not Jewish. So maybe we shouldn't engage. But in fact, if we can take a moment and realize that we're all part of many, many cultures, I feel it's less intense to then share the different cultures that we belong to. If we open up ourselves to sharing with one another, we'll find that maybe while we don't on the surface have something in common, when you dig deeper, maybe we'll find that the girl from Minneapolis loves to go fishing, as does the boy from Muskegon Heights. So I love this exercise as an introductory uh, kind of an icebreaker with students just to show that we're all part of many different cultures, like there are many different pieces to a puzzle that make up a whole. The next question I get most often is, Miss Angela Joy, Miss Angela Joy, but why, why is black a rainbow color? And I love this picture. This is a picture of the Alvin Ailey Dance Company from New York. And here we see a group of dancers, all beautiful, and they all identify as black. So if we take a closer look, there's many, many, many hues and shades here. I like to use food <laughs> to describe. So for me, when I look at this, I see toasted marshmallow. I see caramel. I see peanut butter. I see milk chocolate. I see dark chocolate. I see cinnamon. All different. All beautiful all perfect, but why? It all comes down to this uh, substance that we all carry in every cell of our bodies, and that substance is called melanin. Here's a picture of melanin. If you have science classes, um, it's super interesting to dig into that. I won't hear, but as a general explanation, melanin is our natural sunscreen. So has anyone ever had to tell the children or had it told to you, you know, make sure you put on your sunscreen before you go outside? Common experience, right? Sunscreen is very important so that we uh, don't burn. Burning is bad for our skin. Burning can cause cancer. And so it's very important that we protect our skin from the sun. Here we have a picture of a gentleman who's got sunscreen on one half of his face and no sunscreen on the other. And we can see the additional protection that sunscreen gives. But back in the day, before there was sunscreen, there was melanin. Our ancestors from Africa made melanin uh, in, in greater quantities with more rapidity because they were in the sun all of the time. See, this was their natural sunscreen. Melanin protects us from the sun. And this increased production of melanin is an ancestral gift to each of us here in the United States and all over the world. Depending how, on how far back you're going to go in your studies, you will be able to see that all of our ancestors originated in Africa. One of the markers for that is that all of us, barring disease, are able to turn on that ancestral melanin, that ancestral gift. 
It doesn't work at the same levels for all of us all of the time. For me, my melanin is working all the time, whether I'm sleeping, whether I'm awake, whether I'm in the sun, whether I'm in the shade, my melanin levels are pretty steady. For my mother, who's German and Norwegian, her melanin sleeps most of the time. But when she's out in the sun, the same melanin that makes me brown makes her brown too. That's our body's way of protecting us so we don't burn, helping us so that we don't get cancer. So melanin is a gift. It's magical. Melanin is what makes each and every one of these babies beautiful. You gotta be inhumane to not wanna reach out and touch every one of these kids. They're all perfect. And the only thing that is that makes them different from one another is obviously where they're from, but it's the amount of melanin that their bodies are producing, not just in their skin, but also in their eyes and in their hair. How much their melanin works, how it works. But even our very fair baby in the far bottom corner has those freckles going on and that is her melanin that's working all the time. It's a gift. It's something to be proud of. Melanin is not only in the skin and hair and eyes of humans. Melanin is also found in animals. It is what helps chameleons change color. I used to say because they were trying to hide from their predators, but I had a gentleman, a very wise third grader who said, no, ma'am, they're not doing that because they're afraid. They're doing it to show their emotions. And so Okay, the chameleons change color to share their emotions, and they do that with melanin. The bald eagle uh, would be unable to survive in the frigid temperatures if its feathers were not brown. That brown in the feathers, that melanin absorbs the heat, and it keeps their, their uh, organs warmer than they would be in maybe white fur. Same is true for orcas. Children know of orcas as killer whales and they are master killers. One of their best skills, their, their best techniques is to kind of glide along the top of the water. So any prey that's below them will look up and just see a cloud. The white belly looks like a cloud. And that allows them to get close to their prey so that they can then hunt efficiently. But an animal that big, that close to the surface for that many hours would normally burn. But we don't hear of whales burning. We don't see their skin scaling. And it's not because they're in the water. Of course, we all know we can burn in the water. Many of us have indeed burned in water. But the black back of the orca protects him from burning. And that black skin is filled to the brim with melanin. Melanin is in the ink that octopus and squid use to escape their prey. If that uh, liquid that they excrete from their bodies didn't have melanin in it, it would be clear and not effective, <laughs> right? But melanin makes it work. So melanin is magic. The thing that makes us many, many shades of brown is beautiful. And so for me, that's where the title comes from. Black is a rainbow color. We see that black and brown comes in so many shades. And for me, I, I love seeing those colors together. Yep, caramel is beautiful on its own. Toasted marshmallow is outstanding. But when all of these colors come together, like a rainbow. There's a sense of peace and symmetry to there that I have a great appreciation for. So that's why I like to share with the kiddos. Now, as I mentioned before, we have um, thumbnails here that we can use to dig a little deeper into the historical references that we have interwoven throughout the book. Um, each page, for the most part, has an historical reference. In the back of Black is a Rainbow Color, we have included um, short definitions, descriptions of all of these references. So you can do this activity in classrooms as well. 
Um, but I wanted to give a couple of questions before I open it up to the group. Here we have the page, black is a rhythm, black is the blues, black is sidewalking in spit shined shoes. Our art lesson here is in collage. Uh, as you can see, the artist Aqua Holmes has used many different types of medium to create this page. As I said, she's a collage artist, and so she doesn't work digitally like a lot of uh, illustrators do today. She's a fine artist that has been doing this for a very long time. So she uses large canvas and takes little pieces of newspaper or tissue paper, wrapping paper, all kinds of paper. She'll cut them, she'll put them together like a puzzle. And then she may paint some portions uh, flat or with texture. She may leave other portions unpainted. And so we've got all these, just like our identity puzzle, right? We've got all these different pieces of things that look different that come together to make a beautiful whole. You can see some of the newspapers that she has used are from the 1950s, around the time of the Montgomery bus boycott. And that is the, um, the reference for this illustration. In the back, you'll find a blurb that says in 1955, following the rest of Rosa Parks, the black community of Montgomery, Alabama collectively refused to ride in segregated buses. Instead, as a peaceful protest, they shined their most comfortable shoes and walked to work, to school, to church. For 381 days, they walked until the local government under legal and financial pressures desegregated its buses, allowing all passengers the freedom to sit in the seat of their choosing. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. later stated, we came to see that in the long run, it is more honorable to walk in dignity than ride in humiliation. I just wanna pause for a moment here. It, we have such large lives now, we tend to drive everywhere and certainly it wasn't like that in 1956, but even if you had to walk to your local school and home every day or to the local market and home every day, to work every day, to church two and three times a week and back again, you can imagine their feet were very sore and they didn't have Nikes, right? The technology for shoes wasn't where we are now. They, they made a tremendous sacrifice in walking. It wasn't easy and they did it for a very, very, very long time. So we can't take for granted the sacrifice that was made in walking. Now, I've listed a few resources here. Um, I will make the slides available afterwards so that you can dig in a little further. But as a brief overview, um, we've got some great information here, a lot from the Learning for Justice website. I love the Learning for Justice website. Um, they've got a podcast on the real Rosa Parks, which is brilliant. I highly recommend that. Um, they've got a great play that. Uh, is it's not written. So it's it shows how students can create their own play based on the Montgomery bus boycott. And that includes a video of a teacher actually doing so, which I think is very helpful. Um, then we've got some uh, historical documents, primary sources, and then finally, um, Montgomery bus boycott, organizing strategies and challenges for the older grades. I, I wanna take a moment here and say that um, we, we have the older grades listed here because this book was intended for them too. Kind of strange because we don't think of picture books often for older kids. Some of you probably do. Um, but I had a teacher when my children were small who used um, picture books to introduce any topic that she could. She said it was a great way to kind of whet the appetite uh, for, with students to kind of give them an idea of what was to come, to get them excited about what was to come. It's a great way to say a lot 
in very little time. And so I've used that idea um, to, uh, to make this a tool for teachers of older students as well as the youngers. I think it's especially valuable too that we have such outstanding art. So what we have in Black is a Rainbow Color and really many, many picture books now, the children are holding a museum in their hands. The art is outstanding. And so if there are children who, I think many, many do, who have an appreciation for art, who like to do art, um, picture books are a great way to engage them into topics that maybe they otherwise wouldn't be so interested in. So I say all that to say, uh, Black is a Rainbow Color is a book that has resources that can uh, be used both for the younger kids as well as the older. Uh, it just depends on how deeply you want to go and the resources that you choose to accompany the story. So here's another example. We have Black are the Stones Bearing Witness to Prayer. Black is the Faith in a Freedom Not Seen. Beautiful, beautiful collage work. In the back, the blurb says, in early masonry, cornerstones were the first stones set in construction. Upon these stones, all others were placed. Thus, cornerstones served as the foundation of the building. In the same way, the church has historically been the cornerstone, the foundation of Black American life a safe place for worshipers to pray, sing, socialize, and mourn. Seated at the unique intersection of spirituality and social activism, the Black church birthed the civil rights movement. Like cornerstones Mamie Till Mobley, Ella Baker, Marion Wright Edelman, and Fannie Lou Hamer set the foundation of the modern civil rights movement, organizing coalitions, registering voters, writing for freedom, defending the poor. Learn more about one of these women using the resources on the following page. Now, I will say here that we don't have picture books for all of these women yet. Uh, the story that we have just published is the story of Mamie Till Mobley. Um, let me go back one here. Mamie Till Mobley is the stained glass panel on the far left, the lady with the beautiful blue hat. Um, so that book is available now. But prior to that, the only book that I've been able to find, picture books, have been about Miss Fannie Lou Hamer. And her story is a little rough. Um, so I would I would suggest that particular set of picture books be reserved for the older kids. Um, but we also have, so I've listed the books here. You guys can see that, read that, go back to that uh, at your leisure. But then I also like to ask the students about cornerstones. I think this is fascinating. Um, you can actually do activities where you are starting to build small structures with cornerstones um, and see how in masonry, it would be advantageous to start in the corner and not in the middle or something. But generally, the illustration is pretty clear that the cornerstone set the foundation. So I love to ask students, what about your life? What about your community? What about your culture? What are the, what are the cornerstones that you see there? What are the important people that make a difference? Who are the people that if they weren't there, things would kind of fall apart? Why are they special? What, what, what qualities do they carry that make them important? What cultures or organizations are cornerstones in your community? Are they religious? Are they school? Are they even sports teams? If you have ever been to Green Bay, <laughs> sports is a cornerstone of the community. That football team is very, very important. I don't know if it's true anymore, but at one point, like the citizens were part owners of the, the organization. So sports can be an important cornerstone of the community as well. So again, we're trying to relate to children in a way that is beyond just ethnicity and then roping back so we can see the commonality that we share in these communities, in these cultures. This page is my favorite one to talk about with kids because there's so many different ways that we can go. Um, 
This page again is collage. When kids look closely, they will be able to see the um, their, their poems. The sidewalk is made of different poems um, about black youth, including Raising the Sun. So the page reads, black is the skillet for bread to fry. Black are dreams and raisins left out in the sun to die. A raisin in the sun is the primary uh, inspiration for this spread. That might sound familiar to you. In a poem entitled Harlem, Langston Hughes compares unrealized dreams to raisins left out in the sun to shrivel and die. An analogy so compelling it inspired playwright Lorraine Hansberry to use it as the title of her play, A Raisin in the Sun, the first African-American play to be produced on Broadway. It reads, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Here, we can explore the life of Langston Hughes. Um, there are lots of great resources out there. Um, I've got some listed here, but they're both biographies as well as anthologies of Langston Hughes poems, which are very, very kid-friendly. Um, but then also there are activities that we can pull out from this poem. Using the poem Harlem as a point of departure, explore analogies, similarities, and or metaphors with students. Have them write a poem of their own about dreams realized and or deferred. Here's another commonality. We think Langston Hughes, we think, oh, you know, poor black man in the Harlem Renaissance, who's ex experienced so much pain and disappointment and trauma. And yes, we can study him objectively, but what do we really have in common with him? Everything, right? Because we've all had a dream that just didn't work out. Kids especially are not quite used to uh, rolling on from those dreams that have died. So they probably can remember the feelings associated with that disappointment pretty well. Having the language to express that feeling uh, is important, I think. And being able to express it in an artistic way for me has been very healing. And I think the same can be said for children. Um, so I like to I like to help children uh, discuss the feelings of that dream using dream deferred. Langston Hughes speaks pretty eloquently about how it could feel for that dream to not come true. Uh, and I have a few slides that we can break that down a little further. Uh, but a dream that doesn't come through is certainly something that we can all tap into. Uh, and all kind of find that feeling of community around, if that makes sense. Also, using Harlem as a backdrop, explore the last few minutes of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Have his dreams been realized, deferred, or something in between? How do we make sure his dream, our dream, for a nation does not dry up like raisins? For our youngest students, they may not know that raisins are dried up grapes, which is another thing to investigate. I had a video, we're going to skip the video, um, but it will, will be in the slide deck that's provided at the end if you want to check that out. It's a reading, it's a YouTube reading of the poem we just shared. But with kids, I've got these pictures. And so they can see that dreams can be like a raisin, a round, juicy, inviting raisin, just waiting to be tasted. And when they don't come true, they can shrivel like a raisin. They can fester like a sore and then run. What is fester? This is a great opportunity to learn that vocabulary word. What is fester? like a sore. Again, we all know what a sore feels like. 
It won't stop itching. It won't let you forget it's there. That's like a dream that hasn't come true, that disappointment that just kind of itches in the back of your mind. Is that what a dream deferred feels like? Maybe it stinks like rotten meat, rotten meat, gross, nasty. You could leave some meat on a counter and help the kids by allowing them to smell what rotten meat stinks like. It would be interesting. Gross. But don't use McDonald's because, you know, that stuff does not uh, go bad. Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. I love this. This melted gummy bear on the sidewalk. Oh, the pain. Oh, the pain. That thing that you can see but can't have anymore. It's no good, but you can still taste it when it was. Mm. Is that what a dream deferred feels like? That thing you wanted so badly, but is now crusted dirty, unavailable. I love that he used a sweet here. Again, this is something that we can all imagine. We can all step into. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. The burden of that dream just kind of on us everywhere we go. It's heavy but we can't take it off. We can't shake it. Is that what a dream feels like when it doesn't quite come true? Or does it explode? Does the dream just get so big and so powerful and so angry that it has to explode in order to die? And what is the pain associated with that explosion, with that loss? It's not easy. So when we discuss Langston Hughes's dream, the dream of freedom and equity in this context, it feels a little different now that we can identify with those feelings of loss. We can read some of his work, some of his poetry. I Too Sing America is a really good one um, and see what his dream was. He was not uh, leaving the question unanswered. Um, it wasn't an open-ended question. He was intentional about writing about his dream uh, long before Dr. King had his dream presented to the world. It's a dream that many of us share so I like to talk about it and then ask, has his dream been realized or deferred? Once we've defined the terms, uh, it's usually very interesting to see what the children think about this. Based on their level of exposure, uh, they may need to be swayed either way. It's easy to say we haven't come far at all. That's not quite true but we haven't made it either. And so the beauty of the conversation is found in that gray area. When we can actually look at where we are and where we wanna be and talk about what we need to do to get to that dream, to realize that dream, to help others realize that dream. And then I always ask the kids what their dreams are. This is super fun too, because, you know, once you open the door, we would love to have very, you know, grand and beautiful, loving, equitable dreams. But sometimes it might be, I want that dirt bike. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. It still allows us to connect with one another in meaningful ways. Sharing our dreams, whatever they are, is an intimacy that is 
of tremendous value in our homes, in our classrooms, and in our communities. So I encourage kids to give me five of your dreams, your best dreams, your craziest dreams, and let's share them. Let's talk about them. Let's laugh about them. Let's cry about them. And when we walk away, we will feel a little closer. And I think that is of vital importance. So now we are looking at our screen and it says your turn. I am going to bounce out of here and return with our thumbnails. I would love, love, love to hear from you on any of the stories, sorry, the spreads that we have shared here. I hope you can see them all right. Renee, are we, is this visible out there? I don't know that. There we go. There's my mic. All right. Yes, it is, Angela Joy. Thank you. Um, before I ask questions in the audience, I just want to share a little bit more. And um, I think it's important to why we brought Angela Joy here, why it was meaningful to us. So thank you for the shout out to the Muskegon Heights Tigers. Warms my heart. Um, I was the superintendent in Muskegon Heights a few years ago. And um, Jen Saylor actually was the assistant superintendent, the one who did the real work. Um, and we were working with a community group. And we wanted to have a book for our entire community to read. A few titles forward, and we let that community group choose which one they felt was going to be the best one. They were all great books. But when they chose this book, Black is Rainbow Color, we had no idea fantastic it was going to be. We did a cold reach out to Angela Joy, and she went beyond our wildest dreams, offering, it was during COVID, um, she did a kickoff with our community virtually, and then did assemblies for all of our different grade levels. So some of the examples that she just shared helped you see where you could make those curricular connections, right? We did that with a kindergarten through um, second, I think we did a K-1 assembly and then like a two through five and then a or two six and then a, a seven twelve the back of this book jen and i both have our copies here with us and it is for sale out in the bookstore but you're welcome to take a look at ours and see what she's talking about at the back of the book there is such richness and i don't think she mentioned the um there's a song What's the word I'm missing? Playlist. Oh, yeah. There's a playlist in the back. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, and what you don't know, Angel Joy, is earlier today, um, we've been talking about Paul Lar Lawrence Dunbar, about Langston Hughes, and about Lorraine Hansberry, right? So you're seeing some connections here. So I, I just wanted to share that and how fantastic it was in the Muskegon Heights community to take this as a whole community reads. The book was available. Um, locally in businesses, in uh, barbershops, and hair salons, and the community center. And then um, the students created a mural as well from this book. So it just, we all wrapped around it. The piece about black eyed peas, um, we had a local chef make black eyed peas in a video teaching the students and then challenge them to make them. We sent home the ingredients with our food service program. So all the kids had what they needed. They could make that. And then um, the chef actually said, bring them in and bring in yours and I'll let you compare it to mine. So it was just this wonderful wraparound and, and the book really centered um, all of that learning and all of that joy. We can go back to our Goldie Muhammad speech as well. All right, so with that, your question to the group was what other what page that we haven't talked more deeply about would you like to know more about? Who's got one? Oh, great. Jen's coming your way. Jen's got you. I'm happy to share my book. Anyone want to see it? Thank you so much. Would you talk a little more about the profile of the girl whose beautiful braids are flowing in the back? Yeah, I think it's... Yeah. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you. This page, um, strangely enough, was a little bit revolutionary. 
up until this point, um, the illustrator and I were talking, there just weren't a lot of books out there that showed girls with braids. And so it was really important um, to show the glory of this hairstyle. So many African-American girls are girls with braids and we love our braids and we decorate our braids. And sometimes our braids are long and sometimes our braids are short. Sometimes they're thick and sometimes they're thin. And it's, it's very much a statement of who we are. And yet this is not represented in hardly any book. So this was a very intentional nod to those girls. Um, so that they would feel seen, so that their peers could think of it as normal. My daughter was um, in school, it was a private school in Tennessee, which is, it was a very troubling time. Um, but she was the only Black girl around. When we went to uh, the community, I don't know, play thing, there was a black girl and the black girl had braids one day. And then a couple of weeks later, um, her hair was much shorter without braids. And then a couple of weeks later, she had a hairstyle that was entirely different. And so my daughter's like, what is going on here? She couldn't understand because she'd never been ex exposed to braids. Again, this is mind blowing for me because it's I was raised in a black community. And these are the things that I don't think about being intentional about. But through my daughter's eyes, I can see how that would be a curiosity. I had to explain to her that braids are, um, again, part of our culture, part of our ancestry. Um, our African ancestors wear braids to minimize the time it takes to do hair every day. And braids are beautiful. And I really had, I had to teach her that. She didn't see it in her community and she didn't see it in, her, in a book. So even her black friend was an oddity. We in this book were, were really hoping to take that um, novelty away from braids by featuring this beautiful girl here and her braids so prominently. So that's very, very intentional. We also have some puffs and we have some locks in the background. Um, but as you're probably aware, hair is very important uh, to us. It is more than what is on our head. It's often a fashion statement, a, a declaration of who we are. And so um, on this particular page, there aren't historical references, but there is a declaration of self-love and beauty. And she's smiling, so I'm going to go ahead and say joy in, in who she is and where she is in this moment. And so we were hoping that other children would feel that joy, too, looking at her. Thank you. That's a good one. Thank you for that. You're just connected to a lot of the pieces of Goldie Muhammad's framework, right? Identity, joy, intellect, criticality, we've heard. I've got another question right here. Uh, more of a comment, first of all, thank you so much, um, Angela Joy. And the comment that you just made about braids and the beauty in it, and that it, it, it takes less time um, for, for black hair. Um, my daughter is going through that with her ex about my granddaughter's hair right now because mm. she, she wears her hair in braids and it's beautiful, but her father has a problem with it. Um, but I, I'm going to be, when I leave out of here, I'm going to go buy the book uh, because um, also my, my granddaughter, she's six and she's a reluctant reader. Mm. And I feel like part of it is because she doesn't see as many books that show her that represent who she is and activities to go along with the books. Um, mm -hmm. So I am going to purchase that and, and she and Grammy will spend a lot of time together um, with, with, with the rainbow book. And I, I just thank you for that. Now there was one of the thumbnails with the, with the four women in the church. Mm -hmm. um, and in that it speaks about freedom as well. For me, and I don't know if I heard that, but the, um, the shape that's there reminds me of a slave ship. Mm. And so I, I, you know, I don't know if there was intentionality with that. I didn't hear that, but that's when, when, when it came to that page, that's what I saw. 
Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, in the Black is the Faith in a Freedom Not Seen is a line that I think is easily missed. Faith in a Freedom Not Seen. It's one of the things that I appreciate most about my community is their resilience, but also their dogged grasp of hope, right? <laughs> like, man. The Black community has adapted and thrived, adapted and thrived, adapted and thrived again and again and again. And I think I, I would venture to say much of that has to do with the faith that we have surrounded ourselves in. Um, and we don't, you know, we don't want to get religious per se, but this is the thread that that you will see in many, many, many of our leaders. And it doesn't have to be Christian faith, um, but faith in a higher power, faith in a better day, uh, faith in community, a belief that we together can make it. I don't know where this comes from. It is an inheritance. It's like the air that I breathe, so I can't really define it, but it is magical. And I love that about the Black community. I love it so much. Um, I had not seen the ship, but I am going to ask Aqua about that. Because now that you say it, I can see it too. It's amazing. And thank you for that comment as well. Um, whew. I got goosebumps when you said it. My favorite, favorite comment. And I've, I've gotten it a few times. When people get the book and they give it to their little their little girls in particular, they'll say, oh, mommy, it looks like me. Even if it doesn't look like a child, like they <laughs> feel like it's a brown girl, so it looks like me. And they're excited. They haven't even opened the book. It's just they see a child that they can relate to and they feel like it's them. I think that part of that has to do with the lack <laughs> that we've had so far that will, you know, will identify to anything that looks close to us, right? But that may change. I have hope that it will change. But in the interim, if I can relate to all little brown girls and say you're beautiful, whether you got puffs or braids or nothing up there at all, you are seen, you are important, you are valuable. Just because you see yourself on a book, it says so much. We take for granted how much it means to see ourselves in a book. But if you didn't see yourself, you would know that pain. Inherently, you feel like you are different, wrong, not important. So yes, these books are tremendously valuable uh, to kids of color uh, to feel valued in the society in which they live. And it helps our non-Brown children to see that all stories are important, right? That all children are um, not just valuable, but they have stories to tell that are worthy of reading. I think when we share these books with our non-Black and, Black and Brown children, we make a statement that says, these books are for us too. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people walk by brilliant books with the, you know, bling stickers on top because they feel, they don't even open it. They feel like it's not for them because there's a brown face on the cover. That's a handicap. Kids are missing a whole lot because they don't know that these books are for them too. So by bringing that book into the classroom, you're opening a whole new world of books uh, for these children. And, and that's important too in my humble opinion. So. In, in ours as well, and you're speaking to okay. a room uh, that Dr. Rice referred to earlier as diverse uh, literacy warriors, right? Oh, so love that's, it. That's why we're here. And um, you also are referencing Rudine Sims Bishop's work of mirrors and windows. And so for those in the room, not during this session, but later, <laughs> make your way out to the setup library, if you will. It's out by the front windows right across from the bookstore. And it is about 180 titles of diverse books. Uh, we had the opportunity to 
um, look through thousands and come up with a list. This uh, they're kindergarten through third grade um, mm -hmm. age, but go take a look at them, pick them up, breeze through them, and um, there's fantastic literature out there for lots of children to see themselves in. So thank you for that. I've got another comment right over here. Good morning, and thank you, Miss Joy. Um, Good morning. So if you would go back to slide 15 or thumbnail 15, when I saw this, and I'm grateful that our colleague brought it up about seeing a slave ship, what I saw was the four girls who were bombed in the Alabama church and who they might have become. Mm, mm. And so I thought about um, the Ooh, line, freedom, freedom not seen, right? So they represented for me the freedom not seen um, because we don't know what they might have become had their lives not been cut short um, in that tragic bombing. But I also wanted you to go back to uh, number 11 because it gives me chills every time I look at um, what I interpret as Billie Holiday um, and, and homage to her. So if you could talk a bit more about this particular uh, vignette and, and what it represented for you and for your illustrator. Fantastic, thank you so much. Yes, this spread is outstanding. You're right, that is Miss Billie Holiday. Um, again, we have the collage. And if you look closely, I hope that you can see, if not on the big screen, perhaps in the books that are circulating, her lips are made of newspaper and then painted over red. This is intentional. Um, Billie Holiday, of course, was an international celebrity, treated most poorly in her own country, but around the world, she was adored. And so she used that platform to talk about the atrocities that were taking place in the United States. So before the internet, uh, before 24 hour news, before international newspapers were gracing our city streets, Miss Billie Holiday was the news. She was going to Belgium and Greece and Japan and she was telling them they're killing black people in America. And a lot of people didn't know this uh, shameless act, this selfless act, this uh, bold act of speaking truth to the audiences that she was singing for allowed the United States government to hear from other countries. They heard what was happening and they put pressure on our government. It took time, of course. Um, but it tainted the image of the United States, which was not tolerable for our administration at the time. And so it was just one more thing that helped us move uh, in the right direction. Our allies, our co-conspirators in other countries who said, nope, that's not right. And that is not normal. What you're doing there is incorrect. And we're not, it's, it's, it didn't go as far as um, the, uh, the um, boycott of South Africa Boycott's not the right word, but um, when we stopped trade with South Africa because of our apartheid, it didn't go quite that far, but there was political pressure from other nations for the United States to change their policies in regards to Black people in America, and that helped. And that was achieved by artists like Billie Holiday, who went out and spoke on our behalf in our absence, uh, using her platform for good. The same is true for Nina Simone. Nina Simone is the artist that's featured in the background there at the piano. Nina Simone, um, I'm not sure if you've heard, was trained as a classic, classical pianist. She was not trying to do jazz or blues or any of that. She wanted to be a classic pianist uh, in New York, and she had the talent to do it. In fact, her community raised enough money to send her to go to school at Juilliard, which is a big deal, big deal. She had um, a white instructor who fully endorsed this move, said she would be a star. She got there, she auditioned for Juilliard and they said, no, thank you. We do not take colored people here. Dream deferred. So then she used her talent um, as a singer, songwriter, 
activist to make music that would, again, spread the word around the world of what was really going on here. Uh, she not only agitated in other countries, she agitated here so that she her songs would unify people, would motivate them to stand up and march. And she's got the song. It's on the playlist. The, the playlist is listed at the end of this talk, I promise. Um, but to be young, gifted, and Black. It's one of the songs on my original playlist for my children. So inspiring and beautiful, uplifting for the young people in a time when just about all media outlets were saying you are nothing. It would have been easy for her to just sing jazz and keep it moving. Same with Billie Holiday. They didn't have to make their art political, but they did uh, at great risk to their own lives and livelihoods. And so um, we decided that they deserve to be honored in this book. They are Black people spreading Black love, Black joy, Black culture, Black pain around the world in order to make things better for us. So you'll see the collage um, not only in Billie Holiday's lips, but in the piano in the background, you'll see that the piano is made up of photographs of a cityscape. Billie Holiday was kind of known more as a Southern country girl, Nina Simone had this persona of being very citified. And so that's reflected in our pictures here of these two phenomenal women. And the Hush Now Don't Explain is a song that they both performed uh, that you can find. It's not appropriate for the children, so it's yeah. not on the playlist, but the performances are both so incredibly haunting. You can see why they were able to effectively communicate with their voices. Um, so that's why we say Hush Now Don't Explain on, on this particular page. Thank you. All right, who has another question? We have nine more minutes, so we're getting to the end. There we go. Hi, Angela. Um, Hi. I was thinking about um, your book and um, my friends at my table were all instructional coaches and um, like to be able to push into both lower L and upper L classrooms to kind of model these lessons. And um, wondering if you have any suggestions on connections that we could do um, like with writing to connect with the story for both lower L and upper L. So with writing, um, we did, I think the best, there's two poems in the back of the book, sorry, three poems by two poets in the back of the book, one Paul Lawrence Dunbar and the other Langston Hughes. In both cases, there's a whole lot of uh, reading and writing examples that one could use and then extrapolate lessons for the class there. We also have, when we talk about a raisin in the sun, doop -a -doop -a -doop, we talked about this a little earlier, um, the play A Raisin in the Sun is a great one to examine in writing. And then asking the children, I almost said kids, <laughs> the children to um, write their own plays, write a play's critique, um, take the play and use it. This is for the older kids, obviously. Um, but watching the play, it's there's a Paul, sorry, there's a Sidney Poitier version. And there's also a more modern version that the kids may prefer, but it's not as good uh, with Puff Daddy, P. Diddy. I don't know, that dude. Um, but that's out there recording as well. So having them, the olders watch and critique and perhaps write their own play about that dream that has been deferred or the dream that our, for our community that has been deferred. The example that's there is kind of an old fashioned example about um, a family that has moved into a white neighborhood and they are welcomed by the not welcoming committee and asked to leave and the pressures in that. So that's kind of an older fashioned story. But what would happen if you wrote a play about a dream deferred that has to do with employment or encounters with law enforcement or perhaps the stereotypes that hold us back 
um, in the world of sports or entertainment. In my mind, having the children read, digest, and then reflect in their own writings is something that would be fun and interesting to see. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, as an author um, and poet, is another really inspiring gentleman to dig into. His, we say black is the color of ink staining page, black is the mask that shelters his rage, black are the birds and cages that sing, black is a color, black is a culture. When you hear birds are the cages that, birds are the, the black, sorry, black are the birds and cages that sing, that might ring a bell to you. That is um, the title of Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. She borrowed it from this poem, Sympathy, written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Sympathy is in the back of the book. A good read of I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings would be appropriate and inspirational. That book has probably inspired more people to write their own stories than any other that I've ever heard of. She is a woman that was not trained to be a writer like me, um, but who tried to, she was in a writing group actually, um, that was encouraging them to write their biographies as literature, um, as, as uh, high art, I guess. And so the product is I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. So after reading that, I think that too is inspirational in helping kids to write their own stories as art. I love that because so often our experiences just kind of bounce around inside of us and it can be detrimental. It distracts us from what we need to do. The stress is not good for our bodies. And so um, seeing that other people have taken that stress, that pain, that disappointment and put it to paper uh, to share and to grow and to move on, I think is, is inspirational. Um, in terms of art that we produce. I hope that kids will be inspired to do the same. Um, other writing, Renee, did we have other writing that we did for kiddos? That's a great question. And I was actually running to the bookstore while you were talking about that one, because I heard a rumor that the bookstore is already here has already stole, sold out of black as a rainbow color. Ooh. But but so that I had to run over there because what I have in my hand is a QR code and you can scan it and order it and it can get delivered to your home and you can also support a local bookstore. So if you want one of these, raise your hand, I'll bring it around. I want to defer to Jen on that question for additional writing. Jen, what did we do for additional writing? No, we have um, I'm thinking back, we had in our elementaries, we had writing inspired by poetry at our um, K2. And then I, mm, I think we did more arts-based work for the older grades. Yes. But we, we focus a lot on the poetry at the elementary. Yeah, I would say that could go to any age for any group. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know we were really interested in the playlist at the upper grade, so they pulled a lot of that into, um, but I think they, they wrote in every piece, but I know in every lesson, but they focused on poetry specifically for the elementaries. Okay, so what I do have here that I would love to share before we are out of time and then if we have questions at the end, we can get there. I just wanted to show you what's in the slide deck that will be available probably tomorrow. Um, we mentioned murals. And so, yes, we did. The community of Muskegon Heights had a phenomenal uh, idea to have the community create a mural that is kind of echoing what the book has communicated to them. So as inspiration, I have this, uh, I guess what, three, um, I guess slideshows of different murals um, that were inspirational to me. 
um, and that I hope are inspirational to the kiddos. A mural is obviously a big project that can be scaled down. Um, doesn't have to be something on a permanent wall, uh, but murals can be achieved. Actually, they, they all start out on paper. Um, so that's an art component that we used. I love this class project, tessellations. Woo. So the kids can get the Crayola multicultural colors and they can color one or two, depending on the size of the classroom, of these heroes. And um, they come together in this beautiful quilt, African-American history quilt. And so I have the link there that will bring you to the Teachers Pay Teachers site where you can download the biographies and the kind of black and white pictures of these African-American heroes. And of course it comes out like a rainbow. So I love that. Then we also have some skin studies if you wanted to dig a little deeper into the science like we were talking about before. There's some TED Talks. Um, one of the things I love, love, love to do with the littles is just borrow some of those free paint chips from one of the big box stores and bring them to the kids, spread them out on the floor and say, okay, ready, set, go, find your shade. And they've got such great names for paint colors. And so the kids will go and they're, you know, looking at their hands and trying to see which color is their color. And then they compare and then we put them all together and aren't they beautiful? So that's another way to show that even um, black kids come in many shades, white kids come in many shades. There's many shades of all of us. And so we're not necessarily, it gets really interesting when a child of maybe Greek heritage has a deeper shade than a child that identifies as black. That's really fun. Like that's the best ever. So, you know, those conversations are really great with kids talking about skin. And then um, self-portraits, again, with the colors, super fun. And then there's the playlist. So um, I have used the playlist as a, um, morning inspirational warm yourself up get to know everybody kind of thing uh, but I assume that would be great in classrooms as well um, for a week or two just have a different song at the top of the morning or one that everybody could learn um, that playlist includes the black national anthem which is a beautiful writing study in and of itself um, the poetry there is so 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 very powerful uh, so that's a great one but there's songs, empowering songs from the maybe 20s, 30s to present that kids can listen to. And it's really a timeline of the American, Black American story uh, in America. Angela Dance break, Joy, so, oh yes, we're done. Oh, is it time? Amazing. It is time. It is <laughs> okay, time. Let's sorry. give her a round of applause. This, 